Good morning, everyone. Great to see you today. Uh, Man, we've got a fun time in God's Word ahead of us today. Uh, Some of you may not uh, find history all that exciting. For some people I know, history is boring, except in the case when the history is about you, when it's your personal history, all of a sudden you get interested in that. In fact, consider the popularity of Ancestry.com. You go there, you know, their little slogan is, discover the you who is uniquely you, something like that. Discover the you that's uniquely you. Well, as we continue to make our way through the history of Israel, as we're looking at the big picture of the Bible, I would suggest to you that we are discovering about us what is unique about us as believers in Jesus Christ because who Jesus is and what Jesus did all has roots in the Old Testament. And so when we want to see the big picture of the Bible, we kind of begin with that rescue plan that God set into motion all the way back in Genesis. And so if you're new to us, we've launched into the series called The Big Picture, and we've arrived at uh, no no later than our fourth icon. It seems like we've been doing this a while, and you think, man, we're only like four out of 12 icons. But you see the icons, which basically portray the the art of history. in, of the, the Bible. And you see the Old Testament there moving into the New Testament. And let's just take a really quick review before we jump into today. In fact, if you're looking at your notes on the back of the bulletin, you're probably intimidated. You're thinking, wow, look at that thing. I can't believe that. Like, really, we're going to fill that out? I want you to know that we've set a record number of slides today. 61 slides. 62 slides. So Jeff, I told Jeff back there, man, just like, just keep your, your, your finger on the button, man, because we're, we're moving through this stuff. But we do need to set the context. So very quickly, here's the review. The first icon reminded us of creation. Okay, so there we remember two storylines. One is the idea that God has, uh, God's paradise that he created, put mankind in. God's paradise was rejected uh, by mankind. Okay, so that, like, they, they rebelled against this perfect environment, perfect relationship that God set up with them. But then second, we saw in the book of Genesis that God set into motion a plan to uh, redeem his rebellious people. Okay, so he, uh, God sets into motion a plan to rescue them. And uh, so you come out of uh, Genesis and or the creation icon and you move into the Exodus icon. And there we saw that what God had set into motion starts coming into fruition. Okay, so there's about 400 years between Genesis and Exodus where God sends Moses to go get the people. And so the statement here for Exodus is that God prepares his redeeming people. God uh, prepares the people that are going to kind of bring about the rescue plan, the re- his redeeming people. God prepares them. God uh, uh, rescues them. They, you know, they cross the Red Sea, through the Red Sea. They, they get ready. Uh, they receive the law at Mount Sinai. And they're ready to go up into the land at, at uh, Kadesh Barnea. But remember, that whole generation lacks the faith. They said there's giants in the land, and they pull back. And only Joshua and Caleb had the wholehearted kind of faith to go forward. So God says, okay, let's hang around in the wilderness for 40 years. That entire generation of fighting men die off. Can you imagine the number of funerals every day? Funeral, another funeral. Okay, that whole fighting generation of men, they, 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 they pass on. And so then Deuteronomy comes and God says, okay, Deuteronomy, second law. This is second giving of the law. Okay, he renews the covenant, the Mosaic covenant. He says, okay, we're ready to go into the land. And so uh, Moses hands off the reins to Joshua. Joshua leads the people across the Jordan, dry again, and go into Canaan. Uh, they uh, conquer the land. They get control of the land, but they don't get everybody out of the land they were supposed to. As a result, these people that were there and their foreign gods uh, entangle the people of Israel. And so even though they start with all this great stuff in mind, there to be a kingdom of priests, they get entangled with foreign gods as God warned them that, that they would. And so in the uh, third icon, the icon of conquest, We see that they get entangled. Uh, The judges kind of rule them during seven cycles of sin that just get worse and worse and worse. This descent into darkness. We're told in Judges that there was no king in Israel. And so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And everybody is leaving the God of Israel for the gods of the surrounding lands. It's bad news. But then we get this bright spot with Ruth, who does just the opposite. She's from Moab. 
She leaves the gods of the lands and comes and attaches herself to the God of Israel. So she's a bright light there. And now we come to the icon just marked kingdom. Okay, so this is a, a, a section of scripture that uh, uh, in, entails 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And there's some overlap with First and Second Chronicles as well. And so now we kind of come to where Israel is at this place where, man, like it's, it's, it's bad. People are falling after different gods and the judges have kind of come and gone. Well, l- let's just jump in here. Okay, let's move into the chart. And the first thing I want you to see is that when you start talking about this period of the kingdom, you'll notice that it involves the United Kingdom period and a divided kingdom period. Now, I know that changes your life right there. I know you're thinking, I'm going to frame that, I'm going to stitch that. But let's just kind of get the idea that there's something happening. We're calling this the rise and fall of the kingdom. And you need to see that already you get the sense that Wow, there must be like a civil war. Or like, what happens? Like, why, you know, why do they move from a united kingdom to a divided kingdom? Well, we're going to find that out. So uh, uh, we see a united kingdom and divided kingdom. Under the united kingdom, you have the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Okay, you have a little bit of 1 Kings 2 until they get through the life of Solomon. And then you move into the divided kingdom period. And the divided kingdom period is the remaining of 1 Kings and uh, second kings. And we'll talk about why the kingdom was divided in a moment when we work our way through here. Uh, First and second chronicles was actually written later. uh, Chronicles was written after the, uh, the Babylonian captivity. And as the people are coming back into the land, possibly written by Ezra, we're not, we don't know for sure. And it's kind of a, a later look at what, kind of what happened and a real emphasis on worship and the temple, whereas Kings is really talking about, there's a lot there about war and about the throne, not so much about the temple. But anyway, there's some differences there, but it, it kind of describes this historical period. So First Chronicles overlaps with Second Samuel, and then uh, Second Chronicles overlaps all of First and Second Kings. So a little bit of trivia there for you. Well, let's now kind of do- uh, dive deeper into this. Um, let me give you kind of a big idea of each of these books, and then we'll, we'll dive a little deeper. First of all, with First Samuel, basically what we learn in terms of the story of the Bible is that here God is rejected as Israel's king. God is rejected as Israel's king. Now, this is, this is huge, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this in just a moment. But second, when you move to 2 Samuel, what you find out is that God promises a Davidic dynasty. Okay? In other words, there is this rejection of God as king in 1 Samuel, and then like the, the, the kingdom period starts, and the glory, the highlight of it, was David. And David is promised, as we're going to see, a dynasty, a Davidic dynasty that kind of now gives us more information about the coming Messiah, that he would be of the lineage of David, the one who would sit on the throne and rule forever. All right, so that's really a big deal. So that's 2 Samuel. 1 Kings, uh, what we learn here is that a divided king leads to a divided kingdom. Okay, so here's the story of uh, Solomon in 1 Kings, who starts out so well, as we're going to see in a few moments, but he doesn't end well. And the divided heart of Solomon becomes a divided kingdom. And then 2 Kings, it just gets worse and worse. And so both the kings in the northern kingdom, uh, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, both kind of go their own way. And then God basically is going to remove these two kingdoms. It's a sad story. It's what we have been seeing, if you've been paying attention, that the Old Testament so much is a story of God's faithfulness and man's failure. And we see that Israel has struggled, this, this people who are to be the redeeming people, struggle to really uh, uh, hold on to God, to, to obey the Mosaic covenant that we learned about last week. Nevertheless, God is faithful to them. He will never give them up. And that God is faithful to them, as we saw, because of his Abrahamic covenant. And we're going to see this in the coming weeks as well, that he'll never give them up. And uh, uh, he's going to make this promise to David. And he's going to honor this promise to David, as we see a little bit later, just by way of preview, that our God is an incredibly faithful God to the promises and purposes that he has declared. 
So uh, we, we worship him for that reason. Now let's just kind of dive deeper. And uh, let's look at the book of 1 Samuel. As we said, this basically is going to tell us how God is rejected as the king of Israel. And the book kind of divides in three sections, okay? It's going to deal with one section about Samuel and uh, one uh, about uh, Saul and then about David. Okay, and so of Samuel, there's a demand that's made, a demand for a king. And that's the first part of the book. In fact, let me show you a little bit uh, about that. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 7, Samuel is kind of the last judge and the first prophet. Okay, so he's kind of this transitional figure, key guy, but uh, uh, God and Samuel are very tight and Samuel is upset because the nation of Israel is saying, hey, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king like all the other lands and nations around us. But they were supposed to be unique. They were supposed to be distinct with God alone as their king, a theocracy, not a monarchy. But they're demanding a king. Let me show you uh, what they say. Then all the elders of Israel gathered. This is 1 Samuel 8. All the Israel uh, elders gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the, this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Okay, so uh, God had a plan eventually to provide a king, but this was the wrong time, and this is the wrong reasons. They want a king like everybody else so that they can have some measure of security based on a king that they can see, not an invisible king. Okay, so anyway, there, there's all kinds of things wrong here, broken, but they make a demand for a king, and what do they get? Well, they get King Saul. King Saul was a, a king that was head and shoulders above everybody else. Man, when you just said, hey, I'm looking for someone that looks like a king that can take the Philistines down, here's the man. Okay, so they're, they're like real uh, impressed with, with Saul. But we call this section of the book the downfall of a king because Saul has no real heart for God. Saul cannot, he's not able to trust God. He's not able to uh, have faith in God. And so two different times, one at Gilgal in chapter 13, and once again in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel with the Amalekites, uh, Saul refuses to obey and trust God with the, the circumstances that he's facing. So Samuel, this prophet judge, Samuel comes to him and says, okay, because of your sin, because of your unwillingness to obey and trust God, that God is going to remove this kingdom from you and give it to another who's more worthy of you. And so like uh, Samuel tells Saul that in chapter 13 and chapter 15, he tells him again because of your disobedience that God has rejected you from this kingdom. And Samuel turns away and Saul reaches for his robe and it tears. And Saul looks back and says, in the same way God has torn this kingdom from you because of your lack of faith and trust. Israel made a demand for a king. They got a king, but it's the downfall of the king. In fact, why don't we just kind of pause for a moment and kind of get into our first application this morning, which is simply this, is be careful what you ask for because you might get it. Be careful what you ask for because you might get it. Israel wanted a king. God said, let him have it. And they took a king after basically their own choosing and someone that they thought it would be it. And it was nothing but failure. And, and Israel suffered under his leadership. You know, we can do the same thing. In fact, the book of James, as we kind of fast forward to the New Testament, the half-brother of Jesus, James writes, that sometimes we don't, act, we don't receive because we don't ask. But then he says, sometimes we don't receive because, let me show this to you, chapter 4. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So sometimes we're praying for that new promotion. And, you know, when we, what's going through our head is like, man, if I get that new promotion, people are going to finally stop and notice. Like, I'm something. I'm not someone just to be dismissed. 
Like, man, if I can get that car, God, help me get that car. Because when I drive around that car, like, people are going to think, man, you're a, you're a success. Sometimes we're looking for things and we, 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 we're pursuing things, and it's really not out of good motive. It's not out of good reason. And that was the case where Israel demanded this king, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. Those very things may become your, your undoing if you were to get them. Uh, as we kind of go back to the passage, go back to 1 Samuel, the third part of the book is, is speaking of David, and we call it the development of a king. Because when God tells Saul that I'm rejecting you, I'm going to tear this kingdom away from you, he's giving it to another. Well, we, we find out that that's David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, who was the son of Ruth and Boaz. And so David is going to receive the kingdom. And he's anointed with oil by Samuel. He's told he's going to be the king. But there is a delay of time between those king, the time that the kingdom will pass from Saul to David. And during that time, Saul is just so friendly toward David. Well, if you know your Bible, you know that that's not the case. Saul is very threatened by David and tries to kill him several times. And so Saul's trying to take him out. And so what happens is that David's faith is developed in a huge way while he's basically a fugitive in the nation of Israel while Saul the king is trying to take him out. And so uh, what happens is like Saul has his two times of failure. David has two times of great faith where God puts David in very close proximity to Saul, where David could have killed Saul. One was, you know, while well, David is running around the hills of Engedi, and he's in a cave, and Saul comes in to relieve himself, and all the soldiers with David say, take him out! This is the time you can take him out! And David says, woe unto me, far be it from me to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. David says, I'm not, I'm not taking control here. That's God's job. What incredible faith that he trusts God. That, that same thing happens again where David once sees Saul and all of his men camped out and he sneaks into, while they're sleeping, sneaks into their camp. He takes the water jug and the javelin belonging to Saul. He could have killed Saul right then as his men encouraged him to do, but he doesn't. And he cries back out to Saul from a mountaintop and says, look, here's your water jug, here's your spear, I could have killed you. But David says, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. This is the development of a king whose heart is after God, who's not taking things in control. He's the exact opposite of Saul. Uh, it's incredible uh, what we see here. Let me show you a picture of when I got to live uh, one of my bucket list dreams when Kathy and I went to Israel. And here I am, I'm, I'm in the hills of En Gedi. And uh, in this picture, uh, I'm standing there with uh, one of my professors from seminary, Steve Bramer, and uh, uh, we're there. And uh, I wanted, you know, more than anything, just to kind of run around the hills of Engedi, just to see what it was like. And it's such a, a very lush area of the nation of Israel. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, uh, you've got these uh, falls and oasis and, 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 and uh, uh, different environment. In fact, we're standing out in front of one of the caves that, you know, some of the guides will say, yeah, this is probably the cave where David is hidden in there with his man and Saul comes in. But we, we don't really know that for sure. But this is the beautiful area where God uh, had uh, David hanging out, kind of t trying to avoid uh, Saul as he chased him out. Let's uh, look at our second application point from 1 Samuel. And that's this, is that what we learn from David, the development of a king, is that waiting for God's timing requires trust. Right? <clears throat> waiting for God's timing requires trust. And so you may be here and you're waiting. You're waiting for God to give you more influence, perhaps at work, a promotion that would give you more influence. Perhaps you're, you're waiting for you know, that special someone that you're going to get married to. Perhaps you're waiting to have a child. Perhaps you're waiting for some, you know, some big thing to happen in your life. And when you're tempted to try to make things happen on your own, David reminds us to trust and let God work out in his way, in his timing. Uh, uh, I have a friend who, you know, keeps in his office a picture of a turtle on top of a fence post. I've told you this before. And you ask, well, what is he doing with a turtle on a fence post? He says, it reminds me that that turtle could have never gotten on top of that fence post by itself. Someone put it there. 
And he knows that whatever position that he may hold in his church or in ministry, that he only wants to be there because God put him there. And what he's saying is that I don't want to like try to scrape and fight and you know hurt people to get where I want to be. I just want to be faithful where I am and that God would place me where he wants me to be. So we learn from David uh, these two things. Uh, be careful what you ask for. You might get it. Waiting for God's timing requires trust. Let's move to 2 Samuel, okay? Like we're clipping along. 2 Samuel, what happens is now the whole focus is on David, okay? So David uh, becomes king, and, and uh, basically you can divide his life into three areas. One, you could, you could describe as obedience, and then disobedience, and then consequence. Or uh, you can call it David's triumphs. During his time of obedience, he has several successes, like significant things happen. Great triumphs happen in David's life. But then you move to the tragedy, his sin with Bathsheba and killing her husband, Uriah. Pretty devastating. And coming out of that are nothing but troubles for David as he experiences the consequences of his sin. Okay, well, let's think about more of his triumphs. Well, when you think about these first nine chapters, ten chapters or so of Second Samuel, uh, David, um, uh, he experiences a lot of different things. But uh, one is like he, uh, he builds, uh, wants to build a temple, wants to build a house for the Lord. Uh, this is hugely significant. And God says to him, uh, first of all, Nathan the prophet uh, immediately says, sure, whatever's on your heart to do, go build a, a house for the Lord. You know, up to this time, it, it was just a tent that the Lord met with his people in. The Ark of the Covenant was in a, a, a big tent, uh, the tent of meeting. Well, David wants to build him a house. And so initially Nathan says, sure, go do it. But then God speaks to Nathan the prophet and says, tell him, no, that David, that you're not the one that's going to build my house. In fact, your son will build my house. But God is so impressed with David's heart. And he says to David, though you will not build my house, I'm going to build a house for you. Now, David was talking about a physical structure, a house of the Lord. But when God says, I'm going to build your house, he's speaking metaphorically about David's lineage, about uh, his dynasty. And what God does is he promises to David uh, what is to become known as the Davidic covenant. In fact, I think I, I want to read some of this to you. Uh, this is what God tells Nathan to communicate to David. Go and tell my servant David, 2 Samuel 7, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. All right, so there's going to be someone in the Davidic lineage that will sit on the throne of Israel, the throne of David forever. That's, the, uh, that's more progressive revelation about the coming Messiah, Jesus, who would be called the son of David, would sit on the Davidic throne. Okay, so this is a pretty important deal. That happens during these initial chapters of 2 Samuel, this, this Davidic covenant. And then second, when we move into the tragedy, as I've mentioned already, and many of us know the story that David looks out, he sees Bathsheba, he's attracted to her, she's married to someone else, he doesn't care. Uh, he sins for her, they sleep together, she gets pregnant. When he discovers that she's pregnant, he uh, conspires to have her husband killed. Uh, uh, he basically <laughs> tells the commander to let him uh, be at the gate of a city that they're attacking and to withdraw from him. And so he gets killed and like he arranges for his murder. And like God is not pleased. And so in 2 Samuel, God sends Nathan in to rebuke David. Nathan kind of tells this story and he kind of weaves the story to try to um, help David see emotionally how, how bad this was. He tells this story about this man who owned all these sheep, all these sheep. He had all these sheep, but he had a, a neighbor who only had one little lamb that they, his family desperately loved and would sleep with and they'd cuddle with. But a visitor came to visit the rich man with all the sheep and he had to provide food for it. And so he goes and takes the little loved lamb 
He takes him and kills that lamb to feed his guest. And David said, this man deserves to die. And Nathan says, you are the man. And David just breaks down as he's rebuked. Let's look at this. He says in verse uh, chapter 12, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I appointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. These are significant troubles. The consequences are amazing. Uh, the son dies. Uh, later, one of David's a daughters, Tamar, will be raped. Uh, her brother, one of David's sons, Absalom, will try to avenge her by killing the one who rapes her. He flees. And so he's estranged from his father. He finally comes back into the land, but David ignores him. Absalom will eventually start a coup to take over. David has to flee Jerusalem, where Absalom sets himself up as king. A battle results. Absalom dies. It's nothing but brokenness that results from this. It's incredibly sad. Yet, as we're going to see, that David... The promise that God made with David, his covenant, God's going to continue that covenant. God's faithful even despite our failure. Now, there's a couple of applications that jump out at us from 2 Samuel. and I kind of skipped over one, so let me, let me pick that up. Verse 1 was simply this, is that sometimes when God says no, he has something bigger and better in mind. When, God, when David said, hey, I want to build you a house, that's a really, really good thing. But God said no to him. Because God actually had something bigger and better in mind for David. And that was his covenant with David. That was his promise that, like, man, I'm going to do something through you, your family. We already knew Messiah was going to be a descendant of Abraham. He was going to be a descendant of the specific tribe of Judah. And now we're finding that he's going to be through the specific family of David. And what God promises to David here is bigger, better than what David was trying to do. And sometimes that's true for you. Sometimes God says no for something that you want. And he says no because he's got something better in mind. Sometimes it is a relationship that you wish would kind of like, you know, move forward. But he or she doesn't want to move forward because God has something better for you in mind. And you have to kind of believe that. And so, no, I'm not into country music, but you remember Garth Brooks. Like sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. Like, if we got some of the things that we wanted sometimes, like, it would not be good for us. And so sometimes God says no to that job promotion that was going to have you travel three or four weeks out of the month while your kids are young and you just can't, you know, you just to be separated so much. Like, God says no to that because there's something better that he has in mind for you. And that's what we, we learn with this first part in Samuel. The second part of Samuel simply is this is that though God forgives David of his sin, that same chapter where Nathan rebukes David, you are the man. David confesses and acknowledges his sin, and Nathan affirms him that God is going to forgive him of his sin. And what we learn is that that confession and repentance brings forgiveness, but it doesn't always erase the consequences of our sin. And that's a real important thing for us to understand, is that God forgives us of the guilt of our sin. He restores the break that, that breaks our relationship with him. He, he forgives our guilt and restores the relationship. But many times the consequences of sin don't go away. If you break the law and you go to prison 
uh, that God forgives you of your sin. You, you confess your sins or you, you become a Christian. God forgives you of your sin and your guilt. There is nothing in between you and God. But the consequences that you may have to serve a prison term happens. <laughs> Moms and dads, in your parenting, okay, that when, when your child does something defiant and disobedient, and, and you think, okay, your, your behavior is, is developing a break in our relationship and our closeness. And so, like, I still love you. We're still in, in relationship, but I, we're not very close right now because you're being so defiantly disobedient. And when that son or daughter says, I, I, I agree, I messed up, and the, the relationship is restored, you immediately forgive. But there may be consequences that still a child has to endure. You're still going to be grounded. No, you can't go to that party Friday night. So we need to make sure that we understand the distinction between forgiveness of our guilt and the restoration of relationship. But that doesn't always, sometimes in the grace of God it does, but it doesn't always mean there's no consequences. And so David experienced forgiveness. And he writes Psalm 32 about all of the guilt that he felt during the time that he knew he had sinned and he hadn't confessed yet in Psalm 51. You want to look at those two chapters? All those two chapters is David just emotionally talking about his guilt before God before he finally confessed his sin and then experienced forgiveness. Yet there were consequences that were played out in his life. And that's what we learned from 2 Samuel. Let's move to uh, 1 Kings. 1 Kings uh, we now have switched from, uh, moved from Saul uh, to David. Now we're looking at uh, Samuel. Samuel's the third king. I'm sa- I said Samuel, I meant Solomon. Solomon is the third king in the United Kingdom. Uh, Saul had no heart. David had a whole heart. Even after his sin, God will look back at David and say, this was a man with a whole heart after me. And then uh, David had a whole heart, but Solomon has a half heart. And so as we see, uh, he's, uh, this divided king leads to a divided kingdom. First of all, we see the success of Solomon, the first part of the book. Remember what Solomon does? God comes to him and says, hey, I'm going to give you whatever you ask for. What do you want? And uh, Solomon, instead of wishing for wealth, wishes for wisdom. God says, I, I, uh, because you've chosen so wisely, you've asked for wisdom in order to rule this kingdom, I'll give you wealth as well. God blesses the sots off of Solomon. There's uh, like four W's that can characterize Solomon's life. First of all is wisdom, the prayer for wisdom. The second is worship, because he's the son who will build the house of the Lord. And he does, and it's beautiful. And he dedicates the house of the Lord after it's, it's built. And it's some of the most amazing prayer dedication that you'll ever read. And how that the nations around them are going to look at this place and see that there's a God in Israel. And it's all about their role as a nation to be a kingdom of priests. And it's beautiful. Solomon is doing so well. Success after success. Third W, war. There's no war. God gives them rest in the land like their kingdom is, is, is expanded and there's no war during this time. And then fourth W is great wealth. He has great wealth. That's the end of his success though because there's another W that comes into play that leads to his sin. And that was wives. That Solomon did exactly opposite of what God said. God, uh, Solomon took many, many wives who uh, worshipped many different gods, and they led Solomon's heart astray. Let's look at this together. In fact, uh, I'm just going to turn here to 1 Kings chapter 11. Let me read, uh, starting with verse 1 here. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart with their gods. For surely they will turn your heart away with their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart 
For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not uh, wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And then Solomon built a high place, that's a, a place of worship, a high place uh, for Chemosh, the admonition, abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. These are false gods on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? This is just terrible. In verse 9, and the, Lord, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. This was the sin of Solomon. Okay, well, what is the result of that? Well, the result of that is that God is going to take the kingdom away from him. Uh, th that's why the third part of the book we just called The Split by Solomon. In fact, if I, as I continue reading this passage in chapter 11, watch what God says to him, verse 11. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. What's he doing? He says, okay, Solomon, you, you divided heart. Now the kingdom is divided. So 11 tribes... I'm going to be giving to your son. Uh, actually, not to your son, but the, your, your servant, who will be Jeroboam. Uh, Solomon has a son named Rehoboam. Don't you love that? <laughs> the, these two names, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Solomon has a son, Rehoboam, and he's going to get one tribe. But uh, Jeroboam will get 11 of the uh, 12 tribes. And so what, what does God say? He says, because of my covenant with David... Because of what I'd said to him, that, that a descendant of David will always sit on the throne of David. Like He says, I'm not going to tear this one from you. But 11 of the tribes. So that's when the united kingdom moves to the divided kingdom because of the sin of Solomon. It's just absolutely devastating. Let's take a, an application pause here. Uh, what we read from Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, we're told. Basically, that yesterday's wisdom is no guarantee against tomorrow's folly. Yesterday's wisdom is no guarantee against tomorrow's folly. Some of you, you know, you think back, man, there was a day when I had convictions about like what I, how I was going to handle my finances. And like, I just kind of had this, this conviction that I'm never going to go into debt. Okay, like if I don't have the money, I'm not going to pay for it. And then over the years, you kind of moved away from that. And then you moved further away from that. And now you feel like, man, I'm drowning in debt. Some of you had the conviction that, you know what, there's just certain boundaries that I'm going to draw about the way that I engage with the opposite sex. And then I got kind of more relaxed and more relaxed. And then you find yourself in this emotional affair and your spouse is ready to leave you and you think, oh my goodness, like where was the wisdom? I had in my early days. Uh, somebody goes through high school and they make the conviction coming out of student ministry that, you know what, I'm not going to marry a non-Christian. And they get through college and, man, now college is over and like, they're thinking, man, I'm, really, I, I'm just ready for anyone. And they move away from their convictions. And there's just so much here that we could talk about how we could do the same thing as Solomon. We need to move very quickly through this last book of 2 Kings. And basically, uh, here we see that God removes the two kingdoms. There's the unrighteous kings of Israel. Uh, basically, in the northern kingdom, you know, this is Jeroboam. Uh, there are 19 kings, and every one of them are bad. And each one is described as they walked in the sins of Jeroboam. 
19 kings, they're all bad. Uh, that ends with the nation of Israel being conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C. Young man by the name of Shalmaneser. General comes in for the king, wipes him out, carries people off into captivity. Judah lasts a little bit longer. Uh, they have 20 kings, and 18 uh, or, um, uh, of the 20, 13 of them are good, uh, or 8 of them. Let me do my math again. They have 20 kings, and 8 of them are good. So uh, 12 kings are bad. So eight kings that, that are described as they walked in the uh, steps of David, meaning good, and others who they did not walk in the steps of David, and they were bad. And as a result, I don't have the time to read this to you, but at this point in Judah's history, that they are committing the exact same sins as the Canaanites were all the way back in the time of Joshua when they're conquering the land. They're worshiping the same false gods. They're doing child sacrifice, a temple prostitution, a cult prostitution. Like it's as bad as it could possibly get. And so God is going to remove them from the land. Judah, the southern kingdom in 586, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes through, destroys Judah, burns down the temple, knocks down the walls of Jerusalem, and carries all of the people into captivity. Two applications that we need to think about. Number one, what was unthinkable yesterday can become normal today. What was unthinkable yesterday can become normal today. Look, you can just see that in our country. Some of you are old enough to remember in early television during days of I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke, that whenever there was a scene in the bedroom, it showed the husband and the wife in separate beds, fully clothed. That's not what you see on TV today. What was unthought of in yesterday becomes normal today. How much is that true in your own life where you said, you know, there are things, like the earlier application, there are things I said would not, never happen in my life that I would never do. And have you maintained those things or moved away from them? Second application is forgetting and forsaking God is easier than we think. Forgetting and forsaking God is easier than we think. What we've learned is that Israel comes out of Egypt with all this miracles and stuff, but then they, they, they don't follow hard after God. They, they don't trust God and go forward. And then when God gets them finally in the land, they, in one generation, as soon as Joshua is gone from the scene, they move away from the Lord. We're always just kind of one generation, one step away from like abandoning our faith. Now, with that kind of real sober thought in your mind, I actually want to transition us to a time of communion. Because most of you, if you've been around the faith for a while, you know that what Jesus said is that I'm implementing this ordinance, if you will, this sacrament as a memorial. Because you have the same problem that I do, is that we tend to forget what God has done for us. And so this morning, in response to what we've learned today, I want us to remember what God has done. Let me ask our servers to come forward at this time.